Lisa Fishman. I am the Ruth Gordon Shapiro Class of 1937 Director of the Davis Museum. And I am delighted that the Davis is partnering with uh, Career Ed at Wellesley on several panels this week about careers in the arts. And I want to thank Destiny. And where's Nikki Berlin, who is here too. Um, Nikki is Assistant Curator at the Davis. And they have worked very hard to pull together these panels, including this one, and um, I think organizing a fantastic series of talks by amazing people uh, who make themselves so kindly available to students for all kinds of information and questions. Um, I have prepared three questions and our panelists have had them in advance. Pretty standard questions, I will admit. Um, but to, to in, the, in the hopes of saving time and with Yael's prompt that reading people's bios is dull, which I have to admit I agree with, uh, we, I prepared a document and Nikki is going to put that into the chat so that people can have access to your bios while we go. Um, so, all right, here we, here we are. Um, we have with us Victoria George, actor, writer, founder, Jennifer Ritbo Hughes, class of 06, sorry, Victoria George, class of 05, Jennifer Ritbo Hughes, class of 06, executive director, Boston Baroque, Yael Reinhardt's executive director, Surfpoint Foundation. And in the spirit of disclosure, I should say that um, I am on the board of Surfpoint Foundation and chair of the board, and uh, Jennifer is also on the board of Surfpoint Foundation. So Jennifer turns out to be, you know, the strong link in any community gathering <laughs> because she is really the one who brought us all together. And Amphonisa Udofia, uh, class of 06, um, playwright, screenwriter, actor, and educator. So thank you everyone for being here and thank you to all the students who are joining us. I think, why don't we start with Victoria and why don't I ask the question that I will pose to all of you. Tell us about your career trajectory. What did you study in college? How did you get your first job? What has driven your professional growth? And what are you most proud of achieving as a nonprofit leader? It's a big one. It is a big one. <laughs> and hello, good afternoon, everyone. And good morning for me. It's still morning here on the West Coast. Um, so I graduated, obviously, class of 2005, go green class, and I majored in, as a double major in English and theater studies at Wellesley. So did a lot of theater, um, wrote a lot of essays, did all that fun stuff. And I was primarily an actor, but I did all, almost everything that you could think of also behind the stage. So I did lighting and crew and set design and all that kind of fun stuff. And it was a really great opportunity to learn everything at Wellesley and have all and have like several different internship opportunities as well over the summer in theaters that were locally in Boston. Um, and then when I left Wellesley, I just went in a very weird direction. I ended up going into a field that is not at all related to the arts. So I was in college admission and I was a college admission officer for about 10 years. Uh, I spent four years at Tufts University, and then I spent the last six years at Wellesley. So I was there recruiting students for the college, getting a chance to travel the world and see all these great things. But one of the challenges of doing that work was that it was really hard for me to kind of get back to my roots in the arts. And so after 10 years, I decided to leave um, and ended up working for a nonprofit arts organization in Boston called Arts Boston. And there I did a number of different things, um, primarily looking at ways in which we could diversify audiences, uh, diversify arts organizations, diversify their boards and their leadership, which is like probably what climbing Mount Everest is to many people, um, a very difficult task. Um, and it was great. It was really great, really fulfilling work that I was doing there. And while I was at Arts Boston, I founded a network, an organization called the Network for Arts Administrators of Color. And I realized that when I started in nonprofit arts work, when I started in arts administration, I was often one of the only folks of color in the room. 
And not that I, I mean, I was used to that. I sort of grew up like that for the most part, but it was a little bit disheartening. And as time went on, I would often hear, well, it's so hard to find qualified people of color to fill these positions we have in the arts, which I, I knew was hogwash. So I decided to start this organization to really kind of bring together those arts industries of color in the Boston area who were already in existence and doing the work and were wonderful at it. Um, and then also really start to push the arts in Boston to really think about, rethink their narrative and rethink the ways in which they work with arts ministries of color, hire arts ministries of color, and also connect with their uh, diverse audiences. So that's that's the work that I was doing there. And then um, I left that about two years ago, moved out to LA because I'm also an actor and, and um, a writer and, and I wanted to sort of do something different. So my, my <laughs> career trajectory has been a little bit like this, um, but I guess, at the end of the day, I'm really just driven by my love for creativity and also my um, desire to make sure that people of color are seen in these spaces. And so that's really where a lot of my work, even when I was in the admission field, um, sort of really boiled down to. So hopefully that's helpful. I don't know. Did I answer all the questions that you asked? I think so. I think. Um maybe a little bit more about your achievements, what you're most proud of. Most proud of? <laughs> um, oh, that's a hard question to answer. Um, I will say- It's like an interview, huh? Yeah, yeah. I will say that I think that the, my more proud moments, the moments that I've been sort of really happy are the moments where I feel like I am making a difference in some way and, and, and being part of a, like a change, a shift, a cultural shift. I felt that a lot when I was in um, admission work because I was really working with a lot of students, especially students from low income areas who really need the, the support and the help to get to places like Wellesley and Tufts. And then when I did that work in the arts, I really felt that I was kind of making um, a difference in some way and pushing, pushing, especially pushing arts organizations to really think more critically about who they are um what they represent and also kind of putting their feet to the fire a little bit and making sure that they actually did what they said they were going to do so i think those are the things i've been most proud of in terms of my career trajectory um and the last thing i will say is that i am not i am not generally a big risk taker so just quitting my job and moving out west was a big thing for me to do so i guess that might be the most proud <laughs> uh thing that i have or moment that i've had so far Oh, thank you. That's that's really important to say. You know, um, people come at their at their lives and their career trajectories from very different places. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer, I'm going to ask you the same question. Shall I repeat the question? <laughs> okay. If you don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> so tell us about your career trajectory. What did you study in college? How did you get your first job? What has driven your professional growth? And what are you most proud of as a nonprofit leader? Great, thank you, Lisa. So I'll say I, when I was a student at Wellesley College, I was a music major, um, and I have gone on to have a career career path in in music um, for the most part. I got my first job actually um, through an internship experience when I was an undergraduate. I got, it was a program, I'm not sure if it's still around now, but there was a program where if you got uh, an unpaid internship in, a non, in the nonprofit sector, Wellesley would um, give you a stipend to do that work. And, you know, in, in the arts nonprofit field, there are not a lot of paid internships. And I was not in the position where I could have spent a whole summer volunteering my time. So uh, this was a really wonderful opportunity for me to, to, to get to know it. And I think, you know, I'm a big believer that with internships, sometimes um, it's about learning as much about what you do want to do as what you don't want to do. Um, I've had those experiences where I was like, well, check that one off the list, like never want to do that again. Glad, you know, glad I dipped my toe in that water. Um, so I had the summer internship at the Boston Early Music Festival. Um, and it changed my life. I had not, um, I had known a little bit about arts administration. I'm an extrovert. I'm an organized person. I love the arts. Um, and I really knew that I wanted a life in art, but didn't know what that really meant uh, for me. Um, and Boston Early Music Festival, it's a 
festival where for 10 days, um, musicians from all over the world come together and there are 21 main stage performances, seven performances of an opera. You're, I worked like 20 hours a day and I was just smitten. I just, I turned, I had my 21st birthday there. I was just like, this is amazing. I am hooked, sign me up. Um, and so after um, that summer, I, in retrospect, it was very gutsy of me. I um, reached out to the executive director and set up a meeting with her and told her all the reasons I thought she should hire me um, and create a job uh, position. I came with my little talking points about, you know, if you hire me, these are the things that I think I can do and the value that I think I can add. And, um, and she came back to me and she said, sure, I'll hire you for you know 25 hours a week because I can't afford any more. Um, I'll hire you at the end of the summer because we don't make any money over the summer and we, you know, I can't add staff at that point. Um, and I want to see, I was being paid like $14 an hour. So I uh, supplemented that with a lot of babysitting, um, which paid more than my jobs in the arts for a while. Um, and that's how I got my first job in. After six months or so, I was brought on full time and became the development associate there um, because she saw that that was where, you know, a, a strength of mine. Um, so fast forward, I did that. I then worked at Wellesley College for five years, um, running the concert series at the college um, and working uh, in a position at the time of the college of director of publicity and coordination for the arts, um, developing some unified communications, um, uh, programmatic connections around the arts. Um, and at that point, it was really interesting work, but it was beginning to be more, um, it was a little bit away from my heart in music. And I made the choice, it, it was a, very fertile time for me. I learned a lot. Uh, I got a master's degree in musicology while I was working full time at Wellesley. Um, and, uh, but I was really ready to jump back in. Um, and I became executive director of Cantata Singers, which is a choir and orchestra in Boston, um, founded to perform, it was founded to perform box cantatas, but it does a lot of contemporary music as well. And a lot of commissioning work, um, was there as executive director for six and a half years, um, and have now been, uh, executive director of Boston Baroque, which is the first uh, period instrument orchestra in North America and do a lot of opera as well um, for a little over two years. I also teach at Boston University um, in their graduate program in arts administration, which is why I have a chalkboard behind me because uh, I'm teaching there uh, this evening. Um, in terms of things, um, accomplishments I'm most proud of, um, I have to say I was, um, I worked really hard and I was really lucky to get my first job as an executive director at a fairly young age. I was just barely 28. Um, and I was, I, I thought I was ready. I had done a lot of work, but it was, it was, um, it was, um, you know, it was a jump. And even now uh, I'm one of the younger folks um, who's an ED in my community. Uh, it's a community that has a lot, it, that has, you know, still very male dominated at the top and very few women with children, uh, and which I have two young ones. So um, I'm proud of being able to be in that space and being able to be an advocate in that space, because I think, especially in classical music, there's a lot of issues around, um, especially women being able to advocate for their needs um, as artists and as performers. Um, and um, I see that I've been able to, you know, make a small difference um, as much as anything by simply being there and listening um, and being a, an ear to turn to um, it, from simple things like private dressing rooms to, um, which can be a huge issue in, in theater spaces to accommodating nursing in performances, um, which can also be a huge issue. Um, so I, I'm proud of, of being able to be here um, and, and seeing what that continues to bring. Thanks so Anything much. Else? Yeah. Oh, we'll have, we'll have more time. Don't you worry. <laughs> yeah, I'll jump in. Would you like me to reread the question? Okay. Um, got it. All right. Um, thank you. Um, 
Jennifer, a lot of what you said resonates with me. Um, I have, so Lisa didn't mention how old I am, but I will just say I graduated in 98, like back in the other century. Um, so I feel like I have a few more years of work experience, but um, you know, for whatever that's worth. Um, so my, um, I went to Bowdoin, did not go to Wellesley, but I grew up very close to Wellesley in Newton, Mass. Used to bike a lot there and sneak into the um, lake or whatever it is over there at night and get caught by the police. So that's my connection to Wellesley. Um, I, um, I studied art history at Bowdoin and I had a minor in studio art. Um, I did not feel like I had a lot of guidance at Bowdoin. Um, I had no idea what the heck I was doing. Um, and so having found, uh, you know, one of my teachers who taught a seminar on Jasper Johns um, just became the person I like clung to <laughs> and, you know, was really important. And so one of the things I just wanted to convey to this group is if you find people like that, whoever they might be, uh, whether a teacher or somebody else that can serve as a mentor, I think that that has been really important to me in my um, career. So, you know, they might not say that you're, they're your mentor, but just make them your mentor. <laughs> um, so I studied abroad in Italy my junior year. And then um, my senior year, I was like, what am I going to do with my life now that I have this great fancy degree? Um, I went to the career office and was like, what do art history graduates do? And they said, here is a little file that you can look at. And I literally went to the file and it was a manila, whatever, and opened it up and there was one piece of paper in it. And it had been photocopied so many times that I could barely read it, but it said, there is a fellowship at the Peggy Guggenheim Museum and it's paid, it's in Venice. Um, I looked at it, I could like barely read it, but the deadline passed and somehow I just like convinced them to let me in. So that's what I did after college because there was one thing to do um, and I didn't really know how else to figure it out. Um, after that, I moved to New York and had an internship at Christie's in the contemporary art department, um, the auction house. And that was a revelatory experience in terms of knowing what you don't want to do, like you, Jennifer. Um, I really didn't connect with the corporate model. Um, I really didn't connect with how I perceived advancement um, there. It seemed really sketchy. Jeffrey Epstein, who you all know, was like in the mix. Uh, it was kind of, it was intense. And I, I mean, I could go on, that's another seminar, but, um, but it did teach me a lot. And it gave me an idea of what was happening in the art world, who the players were, it got me to handle art, um, which I had never, you know, thought anybody was even allowed to do. Um, you know, so many things. And from there, I decided the only way out was to go to graduate school. I, <laughs> so I did that and um, got an interdisciplinary degree, which I think is an interesting thing for people to think about. Um, you don't necessarily have to get a degree in a specific thing, but maybe can continue your education if you have more of an open approach. Um, and that led to working in public art. I worked at Cre uh, Creative Time, which was an awesome kind of career launch for me. Same thing, actually, Jennifer. I connected with the director there. I had I'd been working at a gallery and I was like <laughs> in Chelsea whispering on a payphone, which they don't have anymore anywhere, saying like, please give me a job. I need to get out of this gallery. And, and the director there, Ann Pasternak, who's now the director of the Brooklyn Museum, was like, okay, I'll try to find a job for you. So I, I did convince her. And um, that was an interesting experience too. I. Um, we produced the Towers of Light after September 11th, the two Towers of Light that um, commemorate the attacks on 9-11 and many other projects that I think um, were, were and are important symbols um, in our country and maybe internationally. 
Um, so Anne was another person who I just was like, be my mentor. I mean, she kind of was anyway. And she, like, like Jennifer's experience was like, you're good at people here, go, go get money from all these people. <laughs> so I did development work. And um, that, I think that would be another lesson, like, you know, with mentors, they can help you identify skills that you might not know you had. Um, how, do, how does your personality fit with the type of jobs that can actually get you some money to pay your bills? So development is a great way to make enough money to live um, if you are working in the nonprofit world. And I tell a lot of people that don't be afraid of fundraising. It's not the sexiest part of any nonprofit, but it's a good thing to know how to do. Um, and uh, while I was there, and uh, I met somebody who was starting a new organization and uh, that's supporting contemporary artists from Israel internationally. And I, I went to Anne, I was like, I don't know what to do. She said, you know, why don't you work at Creative Time part-time, try this new thing. And if it works out, go jump into it. If it doesn't come back in full-time. And I was like, that's really nice of you. <laughs> so, um, so I did that and it, it did work out. And I, I built this organization called Art Is and worked there for almost 11 years. And um, that's one of the things I'm really proud of. It's just starting an organization, just figuring out how all the pieces fit together. Um, and that's what I'm doing with Surf Point too. So it's a, it's a new organization that's a residency for artists on the coast of Maine. Um, so I'm back in Maine where Bowdoin is. And um, that's that part of your question. Is that enough about that? It's hard to go through your career really quickly. I don't know. Um, let's see. I think that the things that I'm proud of besides what I've told you is that I think there are always gonna be really tough times in a job that you have and times where you're just like, I gotta get the hell out of here. This is just wrong. This person is driving me crazy. This situation is untenable, whatever it might be. And I think for some reason, maybe masochistically, I um, stayed. And I think that perseverance is really important. I've, I've noticed that a lot of people jump around really quickly and don't give things like the time to just, you know, marinate. And that going from one place to another is not really solving the problem. So I think perseverance is something to keep in mind. Um, I won't say that that's what millennials do, but I kind of have noticed that a little bit. Um, building relationships also, I think super important. And, you know, trying things that you think you might not have a skill in, I think is another, another piece, just diving into that. Is that all the questions? It is, thank you. Thanks very much. And Poniso, could you please uh, do, would you like me to read the questions again? No, I actually have it up in front of me. Oh, look because. at you. <laughs> um, Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Poniso, I'm class of 2006. And when I was at Wellesley, you know, I kind of, um, I didn't choose my major, my parents did. And I was very, I'm like very traditional Nigerian household. So I walked into Wellesley going, I'm gonna be a lawyer because somebody told me when I was five that that's what I was gonna be. Um, and so it took me a while at Wellesley as I was inside of my political science classes to realize that this was not the do. This is not what I needed to be doing with my life. Um, and it took me a second to figure out that even though I was good at something that didn't need, mean I needed to yoke myself to a career path without like interrogating why I'm doing it. And so um, the arts had always been within me. It was just because of like an academic trajectory my parents were setting me up on. I looked at the arts as a 
way to get what I wanted to academically and into a law career, as opposed to looking at the arts as something that I might be good at and I like to do. So it took me a second at Wellesley to like reorient and go, okay, I'm gonna complete, I decided to complete my political science uh, degree. And at the time I couldn't like all of a sudden, or at least in my head, I didn't think that I could all of a sudden become a theater major. But what I did do was I started, you know, um, taking a lot of classes and um, like putting myself up for, you know, parts going, I will do this. Um, and then uh, I was a member of Ethos and we brought back the Black Arts Chair and I did that for a while. So I was able to, through Ethos, put on productions of shows that I loved that I thought sometimes like the theater department, I didn't know if there would be interest at that time for some of the shows that I was really interested in doing. So at my time at Wells, I think we put on things like um, For Colored Girls, and then we put on Honey Hush, which was an adaptation of a Monique play because I thought I could adapt a play. It was all very hilarious. <laughs> and at that time, like, you know, I was like, okay, uh, I'm not gonna be a lawyer. What I loved to do uh, was acting. Um, and I sang a lot while at Wellesley. I sang opera as well. Um, but acting is the acting bug that bit me. And so I went on to the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. That's where I went next going, I'm gonna be an actor. And I got there and because of like the Wellesley rigor of everything, the first year of conservatory was very hard for me as they were telling me to breathe. And I was like, what is your pedagogical reasoning for why you want me to breathe right now? So, <laughs> but once I clicked in, I clicked in and I was like, yes, this is gonna be my job. And then I get to New York and it's 2009 and it's the worst recession ever. Um, could not get a job, nobody was going to theater. Um, you know, it was a moment in life where I really thought, uh, my parents were right, I did the wrong thing. Um, and it was a moment where I was thinking about giving up, but then just like stubborn going, I can't because I can't, I will not be proven wrong this early. So um, how I did it was I, you know, I was auditioning, couldn't get anything. And then um, I started cobbling together work. So there was a moment where I was like an executive assistant. I was teaching at Harlem Children's Zone and then like doing little seminar classes at Fordham. I was also babysitting at night. I was just, it was, uh, I was working retail sample sales, anything that would put money in my pocket, I was doing it to try to chip down at the arrears on my rent, which we kept accruing. Um, and I was writing to process the world and the way the writing came out was the way in which I'd been studying. So it came out in play form. And interestingly, my plays took off before my uh, acting career could. And it's, for me, it's different for everyone. My first, my first like break in was through like Harlem Nine. They were like, you can come and write me a 10 minute play but I was writing next to some fancy, fancy people. So there was some eyes on it. And that helped me keep spinning those writing moments into more, more. I just needed to get in. Um, and so I was writing um, and then I began like the application process that a lot of writers know about where I'm like in a month applying to like 40 places if I can, just so I can get one more job. Um, and then I began writing my nine play cycle and that really took off and I got my first production with the playwrights realm. Um, and then it was critically like, like panned and I thought my career was over because when, when you're panned in New York, it feels it's like, it's, it's tough. Uh, but then New York theater workshop came in, scooped me up and said, your career is not over and it wasn't over. And, um, then the plays went on regionally. Um, and in that time, I did start an organization. Um, I haven't been able to like produce a lot with it lately because I have been practicing more. Uh, but I started the Now Africa Festival. When that festival, um, because I am Nigerian, and one of the things that was really uh, frustrating to me was not being able to see representations, I thought, of Africans on the theatrical stage. And when it was done, it was done in a very certain way that made me feel like, I don't know who those people are. So we wanted to 
unearth a canon with now Africa that we felt should have been taught but never was. So we put on like three day festivals of work from um, different countries in Africa and was like, here, take a look at this. Like we're, we're not the only ones um, because there's a way in which you go, that's the African playwright. And it's like, no, there's so many of us. And so um, that's the festival that I built. And uh, from then I went on to uh, screenwriting. So I'm a writer producer now on um, a lot of different TV shows and have started writing for and working in film as well. So um, I guess to bring it all full circle, I finally did get to act in one <laughs> off Broadway show. I don't, I don't know if I'm an actor anymore though. I did that one show. I was like, well, we're not going to do this anymore. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, that's like, that's it in a nutshell, I think. And when I think about my greatest accomplishments, they do happen for me in the teaching sector. So I'm very proud of Now Africa. I am very proud of the work that I've done places at Harlem Children's Zone. Like it's almost like there's no pipelines into what I'm doing right now in terms of TV. But like now that I'm there, I can bring my students in, in a different kind of way. And those are the things that I am most proud of. Wow. Thank you. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, well, I think um, I have a lot of questions, but, you know, we're going to go back to the, to the, um, the stated questions. So uh, perhaps we can take the, um, the same um, orientation and um, start with Victoria. And um, I wonder what has surprised you most about working in the nonprofit sector? Um. Well, first of all, Emmy, I did see that show that you were in off-Broadway and you were fantastic. So you better keep acting because it'd be a shame if you stopped. <laughs> Eight shows a week. Ooh. I, I know. <laughs> Limited run. We'll do one of those. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, Lisa, uh, I'm going to answer it slightly differently because I will say that um, I don't think there was a whole lot that sort of surprised me about working in nonprofit arts um, because I was sort of expecting what generally happens. It's very scrappy, um, unless you're working for an organization that has a really nice budget. I mean, you are just hustling, hustling, hustling. And, and it's just like it, it is if you were, you know, in a, in a small theater, trying to run a small theater or, or to be a part of it. So I can't say there was a whole lot that sort of surprised me about that world. What was surprising to me was that world existed. And I had no idea. Um, you know, coming out of Wellesley as an actor, I just thought, well, you know, the only path I could take was to be a performer. And I had absolutely no idea um, what was going on behind the curtain. You know, obviously a theater has to run in some way, right? So there have to be other people behind the curtain that aren't crew, uh, that aren't performers, uh, that isn't the director or the artistic director. And I think just um, finding that world kind of opened up a whole new, sort of a whole new avenue for me. And it really kind of helped me appreciate a lot more uh, what sort of the, the business that goes behind the arts and how without that side of it, it is nearly impossible for creativity to really kind of continue to happen and sustain itself. And I think that if I had known for sure, well, I don't know, hindsight, right, is twenty twenty. So if I had known that was an opportunity, maybe I would have gone into it sooner rather than later. Um, but more than anything, it was kind of a nice surprise, you know, 10 years after I'd graduated from Wellesley to see that there was another way that I could be connected to the arts, um, even if it wasn't directly through performing. So yeah, that's it. Um, for me, I think what was most surprising um, in a great way has been how creative being an arts administrator is um, and that, um, you know, you have to be very practical, you know, I spend a lot of my days in P&Ls and financial forecasts and vision planning, but um, it's very, the, the, the way, 
I think I'm constantly creatively problem solving every day. Um, and, and I love that creatively problem solving in the service of, of, of art. Um, and um, that has been both a surprise to really understand the depth of that. Um, and it's been my biggest motivator. I was trying to think about why I came up with a lot of negatives, even though I love being in the nonprofit world. <laughs> um, but I guess I just wanna provide the opportunity to just be, I don't know, inject some realism about how there's gonna be negatives in any field and anything you go into as well as positives, obviously. But, and maybe this isn't even a negative, but I think that it was, really surprising to me to see how much privilege and money has to do with nonprofit work. And I still am grappling with that, the way that the system is set up in this country and how it all operates. Um, you know, the dependence that nonprofits have on philanthropy and on individuals of wealth um, and so I'm not saying that that's bad, but I am saying that it's something that I've had to develop a comfort with. And sometimes that is troubled. So when, you know, when I was living in New York, I had to go to the Upper East Side like all the time <laughs> to meet with various people and go to their events and all that stuff. And I just, you know, I didn't really love that, but it is really what is making this stuff, at least the nonprofits I've been involved with, um, making the world go round. So that's one thing. Um, I think also it's really the size of a nonprofit is really striking to me, like how, what it means, you know, um, my sister, for example, has worked in really large nonprofits. I never have, um, that's been less appealing to you, to me, but there's a real difference in terms of how nonprofits work, just in terms of a scale of like five people to 20, I don't know, and then on up. So that's something to pay attention to if you're thinking about different nonprofits. Um, I have a few more if I have time. <laughs> I'll add a couple more. Uh, the cult of personality has also been really striking. Um, there are usually really strong personalities involved, founders, what all of that means, you know, um, that's been really surprising. How much you can learn on the job, um, not to say that you shouldn't get an arts administration degree or take a class with Jennifer, but um, I think you can get a lot of on, on the job experience. So um, doing an internship, if you can figure that out is, can really get your foot in the door. Um, and I think I'll just end there. Um, as I said before, I, I straddle the world as like a practitioner. And then I'm also within the um, nonprofit world as well. I do admit that for me, one of the biggest surprises was how hard it is to have both of those lives at one time. Uh, it's very difficult for me. And I, I haven't mastered it yet. And I find myself always putting something down for the other. It's very difficult. Um, but when, um, when I'm within the nonprofit world, like what's happening for me, I'm gonna talk about now Africa. It, it, it's very, very scrappy. There's only four of us. So the amount of work is eye-watering and mind-boggling. And uh, it, I did not realize how much work goes into it and like the multiple hats. So like in that organization, I am working as the artistic director, which, are, and then also like helping fundraising as well. And then turning around and doing all of this research, kind of dipping my toe into development as I'm helping like write grant. It's a lot, it's, it was, it's a lot. And so uh, it's part of the reason why it's hard for me to be a practitioner when a season for now Africa is coming up. I can't do both. Um, 
something else that surprised me specifically with Now Africa was how much I could get done as uh, when I said I was part of Now Africa as opposed to when I was one person. Like the access for me, I, it was it was revelatory. I just simply didn't know. I would walk into the Schomburg and was like, could I have some of these manuscripts? And it's like, no, you can't do that. But the moment that we became Now Africa, all of a sudden things were opened up to me in a way that was, it was just, I did not realize. And so it's part of why um, holding archival is so important for me lately now too. So that people, I'm like, as an institution, that's something that I can give is access to work that feels as if it's very cordoned off. Um, so the power of a nonprofit, I didn't understand in relation to access. Um, uh, and then, because uh, we are so small uh, and our mission is so Africa forward, it has been a thing about money um, for me and, and uh, which money we're taking and why and the morality around money has become a huge thing. And I know that if I had a board, I probably would have been fired many, many times over as I'm like, no, we can't take that 35K because of what they just did yesterday. And in an organization that's as small as ours, that money is lifeblood that can take care of us for like three seasons of this, you know? So it means it's been it's been quite a difficult road. Um, and then the last thing that I can think of as now switching on to my practitioner hat that I didn't realize about nonprofits, specifically in the arts, is how much of it is it feels like patronage forward for me. It's almost like the amount of galas I go to, high heels I'm putting on in order to like, as an artist raise money for the organization, I did not understand how much of that I would have to do and how much of how I'm paid comes from those direct funds in. So that's me. Thank you all. Um, I'm hearing, you know, a lot about the complexity of this work, um, about nonlinear paths, about your flexibility and openness to opportunities that maybe you hadn't anticipated or hadn't even known about, um, your ability to hustle, your uh, commitment to creativity, um, the importance of relationships the stakes and the relationship between the lifeblood of every one of these nonprofits to finance. And I wonder, you know, any student who's listening now who may be as I was at their age, completely, you know, just completely new, didn't know anything about nonprofit work and really didn't know what happened behind the scenes. So what, what could you tell them? How do you get involved? What's the first step? Victoria, you want to start? Sure. Um, you know, I think that I think because Jen, you've already mentioned just um, or maybe it was Yael, like mentors or looking for people um, in that regard. I think that's definitely helpful. And, you know, looking into the city that you eventually want to be in and um, looking up either various arts organizations or looking at the state agency because the states, right, each state has like an arts wing to it. Um, I remember one of the way, like the first way I really learned about even just where to look for these jobs, you know, instead of just doing a blind Google search, uh, someone told me about a, a website called Higher Culture, which is um, a really, really great kind of job forum that's that's Boston focused, or I think like Boston and Central Mass or something like that. And there is another similar one that's out here in LA. Um, I think it's like Arts for LA or something like that. So I, I imagine that there are a number of these kinds of, of either organizations or, or listservs or things along those lines that can be kind of a really helpful resource in trying to figure out even like where to search, how to look, how do I even find any of these jobs? And then when I do, you know, is there either, um, you know, 
a forum that I can reach out to, an, an alum that I can sort of reach out to that might sort of have a connection or contact in that arena. Um, there are certainly a lot of ways. And I think that primarily what is the hardest thing, and even just for me, is just taking the initiative. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to, it, it, it's overwhelming, you know, like, what, what do I do? I'm about to graduate. Like, where do I go from here type thing? Um, but taking that sort of that first step and that, that initiative is probably going to be the hardest hurdle because there's a lot of information that is out there. Do you all, do you others would just jump in? Want to just jump in and add to that? I would, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. I would just say that um, don't be afraid of peripheral places. Um, having lived in New York for 20 years, you know, I felt like that was the only place where contemporary art was happening and where artists lived. Um, there are many other places in the country and in the world. Um, so don't be afraid of that. Although there are, of course, usually more opportunities in big cities. Um, but there maybe are more interesting opportunities in smaller places where you can make, a, you can have more of an impact and get somewhere quicker, you know what I mean? Um, so that's something I think that maybe is even changing a little bit more now. Um, internships, many of them are paid. So um, I think there's a recognition now that, you know, it's really exploitative <laughs> and people need to be paid. And so maybe don't assume if you are that internships aren't paid because um, they can be that gateway to the job. Um, asking people what their favorite nonprofits are and why they love them and maybe if they can introduce you. Um, using LinkedIn, I know it's like maybe not so sexy, but um, I don't know, people like to be approached on LinkedIn and like will respond to you probably. So, you know, after this panel, I'm probably gonna LinkedIn all, everybody on this <laughs> panel, <laughs> who knows? Um, and one last thing, which is about like thinking again about what skills you'd like to build or which ones you might naturally have. Um, I think just doing some of that introspective work about who you who you really are, even if you're, you know, a senior in college. I don't know that I have anything to add beyond what has been so brilliantly said, um, except for, I, you, I think, Victoria, you talked a little bit about fear. And I, I just wanna pull out there that direct asks have always been my friend. I, I have cold called like playwrights and people who are in organizations, just written them an email and gone, this is what I'm excited by. Do you have a lunch break? And if you could know how many times I've actually sat down and began the process of getting in the door by that kind of stuff. So it's amplifying what's already been said, I think, but to not be afraid of a direct ask for an hour of time and see how far you can get. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always, you know, I say, you know, asking something is free. Every, the only thing we can have is they can say no and saying thank you is free. Right. Um, and that's sort of my mantra navigating my 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 path. I will say too, I mean, I'm sure we all get this. I love it when a recent alum or a current student reaches out and just wants to have a conversation, and ask a question. I always appreciate their um bravery doing that because learning how to do that is a skill and and the Wellesley alum network um, first is remarkable and it's a it's a network that people are you know you know even on a busy day you know I'm happy to spare 20 minutes for somebody to, to talk with them and and you know I've met some wonderful people um, through that as well and I really encourage people to to think to think and and spend time researching the people who can who can help you along the way. I think those are fantastic tips. So thank you for those. Uh, let's open it up to students and see if anyone has a question. 
you could raise your hand and turn on your camera or you could pop something into the chat. Anything that might be of interest? I have a question which was um, sent to me from one of the participants who is having um, not great connection right now. Um, okay. So I can ask the question on her behalf. Um, so are there perhaps, so um, they are a recent Wellesley grad um, and are working part-time um, doing administrative work and grants work for an arts consulting agency that works to support nonprofits in grant writing. Um, but they are also um, a playwright and, and developing work um, and practicing as a playwright. And um, they said that they are thinking a lot about how to balance and looking for like tips or advice around how to ba balance kind of authentic work as a playwright and being a creative person while also kind of protecting your reputation as a, as a nonprofit professional, especially if the kind of work that you that you engage in your writing, you know, sometimes takes on topics that, you know, might seem um, in conflict with some of the kind of arts organizations and the kind of the, the, the constructed world of the arts. So thoughts about how she maintains a professional image while kind of also um, being authentic in the work in the work that they do as a writer. I think I should maybe try to tackle a little bit of this one. Um, I, I, for me, story is always queen. Like I don't adjust in and around my, my playwriting, which is, this is purely subjective. And so I have a tendency for me to go, whatever my playwriting needs are, I, I never, I never vie away from what true North is. And sometimes that has put me into some weird positions when I am within, specifically when I am teaching. And depending on how I wanna teach what I'm teaching, here is the work that might be like a little like red flag over here. And so for me, I know, and I don't know, you all can like jump in as well. There's a way in which I've had to also like just shore up my foundation a little bit. I do it through a lot of affirmation work going, there is no part of me that needs to change from place to place. Uh, I am not gonna be afraid of the work that I create. And this is also the job that I do right now. And if somebody is gonna call out the tension and the intersection between them, I'm going to answer as an artist. That's me. And that's how I handle that tension. But I want to afford that it's not easy. It's a lot of like me having back and forth with myself. And I'm like, as long as I'm constantly interrogating, I am fine. But I always lean into the artwork as opposed to what I am doing inside of the nonprofit. Because for me, the artwork, that's actually, that's my body, that's a piece of me. So that's what happens when I'm practicing. So um, if anybody else wants to jump in as well, that's my answer. And Corinne, did you have a question? Yeah, hi, I did. Um, thank you so much to all of the panelists. I'm a senior art history major, so panels like these are so helpful. Um, several of you mentioned how you approached a mentor or a supervisor, somebody that you've worked with in the past and try to have them take you seriously and consider you for a, a role in their organization. And I was wondering if anybody could say more about that, like how to approach somebody you, you already know um, and initiate that conversation. Who wants to jump in? Just jump in. I think that um, one, like, yeah, I, I was thinking about my, my work at Christie's. I had to like find a way to stand out. Um, and so I don't know, I did weird audacious things, I guess at the time, like be like, 
hi, I'm representing all the interns and we think that we should see like Wednesdays should be off and we should all be able to go to museums. <laughs> and they're like, okay, no. <laughs> um, but, you know, just putting your thoughts out there and also kind of like reading who your audience is, right? So I kind of read that and I was like, okay, that wasn't a really good approach. But um, with other people offering to do work maybe for free, <laughs> or in some kind of capacity, finding out what kind of projects do you have going on that you might not be able to get to? Can I help work on those? At another job, um, I organized the archives for you know a 30 year old organization. And they were like, yeah, this is great. And that, that's what parlayed into a job. Um, so that's, that's one tip that comes to mind. I would, um, I would also add that, this, especially because if it's someone that you kind of already know or have some kind of connection with, I think it's perfectly okay to let them know what your, what your desire is. If it is to work in that organization specifically, please let them know that. Or if it is to say, you know, I, I need this particular skill or, you know, is there a skill that you think I need in order for me to get to this place that I want? Um, I would say be, it's okay to ask and be specific because, you know, not that, not that anybody would do this um, consciously, but it, it could be that you could, you could offer your help and, and, you know, they take your help and then at the end, there's nothing there for you, you know, and, and if there is not going to be anything there for you, hopefully you can have that conversation early enough. And then you can say, well, if there's nothing here for me, can you please help me find somewhere else where there might be an opportunity? Or is there someone else that you know that might have a, an opportunity for me? So if you're, if, if you're, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of like goal setting in a weird way, um, because you're, you're, you're asking for their support for a very specific reason. Um, and as specific as you can be, I think will really kind of help you push you forward faster. Thank you. Hi, Haruka. Uh, hi, yeah. Um... Do you have a question? Yes, um, hi. thank you so much, first of all, for a wonderful panel. Um, I'm an international student from Japan and an aspiring actor playwright. And I was wondering if you guys had any recommendations for international nonprofits or any organizations that you think um, do work across sort of borders, I guess. Um, I'm not sure if I can stay in the US, I hope to, but I'm not sure exactly how to do that yet. And um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much. I'm going to be honest that part of what makes this question tricky now is because of where we are, are where we also are with COVID, which has made a lot of the international programs that I know, like Sundance, like BAM, places like that, that actually, that it's specifically Sundance has got, it's, it's, um, it's a tricky, none of this is our easy floors to like enter in from. So I'm not, I'm not going to pretend there either. <laughs> These are not easy floors, but what they do do, which I think a lot of American theater does not do enough is they hold the international. They do. Um, and things have become dicier with COVID, but those are two that come to mind. Sometimes New York Theater Workshop has dabbled in it. Um, and again, the places that I am naming, the, the polls for access can be very, very high. And so if you were interested in them, I would start looking at some of the associate lit manager, some of the lit managers of these places have a little bit more porosity. And then we should also talk so that it can be like, you could also have, you might, you might wanna like a name, like I talk to him funny so, and then you send that letter, that kind of thing. Thank you. I think we are um, we are at 3.30. And I think that is the conclusion of our time together. Uh, if there's maybe one more student question, we could take it or we could thank you all for being here and thank you for your time. And let me say what a huge pleasure it is to see you all together, even uh, virtually. Sometime we will get to meet in person again. That would be 
fantastic. Thank you so much, Destiny and Nikki for uh, supporting this panel and all of your work behind the scenes to make it happen. Hey there, Nikki. And um, thank you to our panelists and our students for joining us today. Nikki, did you want to say there's one more, right? One more in the series tomorrow. There is. We uh, we have a panel on the fine arts and humanities um, tomorrow from 2.30. I'm sorry, tomorrow from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock. So um, please do join us for that. And thank you so much to, to all of our panelists today. This was just wonderful. And thank you, Lisa, for moderating and Destiny for co-organizing. So and all the students for joining us. This has just been a wonderful series so far this week. And it's, it's so nice to see you all um, on here. Thanks, everyone. Have a good thank afternoon. You. Bye. Thank you.